If you haven't had a chance yet to watch my video over translational initiation, I encourage you to pause right now and go back and watch that. In this video, we're going to be talking about the elongation and termination portion of translation. In this video, we'll look at the protein and non-protein factors that make this process work, and we'll draw it out. At the end of initiation, our informal methionine on our charged tRNA will be located in the P site of the 70S ribosomal complex. Or, if it's eukaryotic cell, it would be in the P site of the ADS complex. In eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, elongation is going to be roughly the same. At the start of elongation, a charged tRNA is going to bind to EFTU or elongation factor TU that is primed with GTP. Remember that GTP is the energy source of translation. Our charged tRNA is going to bind to the A site of the 70S complex. At a certain point, we're going to hydrolyze this GTP to GDP in an inorganic phosphate, and at that point, our EFTU is going to leave. The GTP hydrolysis and the EFTU leaving is going to catalyze the formation of a peptide bond. If you watch my video on the peptide bond formation, you'll recall that the amino group on the amino acid and the amino acetyl site is going to attack the carbonyl carbon of the amino acid and the peptidyl site. By attacking this carbonyl carbon, we force this group to leave and we form a bond between the amino terminus or the N terminus of this amino acid and the C terminus of this amino acid or polypeptide later in translation. In non-chemical terms, what this means is that the amino acid or polypeptide from the P site is transferred onto the amino acid in the A site. Additionally, EFTU can be recycled back to EFTU GTP using another elongation factor called elongation factor TS. Elongation factor TS is essentially like the recycling elongation factor because it helps recycle EFTU back to its active role. So the amino acid or polypeptide, in this case informal methionine, has been transferred from the tRNA in the P site onto the amino acid on the tRNA in the A site. Now that this has happened, we have to translocate this to continue this process of translation. So what's going to happen is elongation factor G or EFG, which is bound to GTP, is going to briefly associate and then the GTP is going to be hydrolyzed. Hydrolysis of this GTP is going to cause EFG to leave, but it's also going to cause the 70S ribosome to translocate. During translocation, the 70S ribosome will slide one codon to the three prime direction. As that ribosome translocates along the length of the mRNA, anything from the A site will move to the P site, and anything from the P site will move to the E site. And there's really nothing that stays in the E site when something moves from the P site into the E site, it's just ejected out of the ribosome. We're actually going to end just like we started, with a tRNA with amino acids on the acceptor arm in the P site. So we can continue elongation over and over and over based off of these same steps until we reach a nonsense codon. And remember, when we reach a nonsense codon, that's when we start termination. Now let's take a look at termination. Recall that termination is when we reach a nonsense codon. So when we reach a nonsense codon, we're going to have something recruited called a release factor. And a release factor is going to have an anticodon that's going to correspond to one of these nonsense codons. And this may be FYI for you, but I just wrote this up here. RF1 will go with UAG or UAA. And RF2 will go with UAA or UGA. But either way, they're effectively the same thing, where they have an anticodon that's going to match with one of these nonsense codons. These are called RFs because they're release factors. So RF1 or RF2 is going to bind in the A site. After RF1 or RF2 binds in the A site, another release factor called RF3, which is bound to GTP, is going to bind. So RF3 is going to bind to the 70S ribosome. And when it binds to the 70S ribosome, our polypeptide chain is going to be freed from the tRNA in the P site. After a polypeptide is free, we're going to hydrolyze this GTP to GDP in an inorganic phosphate and everything is going to dissociate, meaning our tRNA is going to leave, our 50S and 30S subunits are going to come apart, our mRNA is going to be freed, and it's probably going to be broken down at this point, and RF1 or 2 and RF3 are going to leave. So again, when we have GTP and we hydrolyze GTP, it generally means that things are going to be leaving. But ultimately, what GTP is doing through translation is being hydrolyzed, releasing free energy to be coupled to a dissociation, or a bond formation, or a translocation, or something else like that. A helpful way to study translation is to draw out the entire process 
and consider the effect of inhibiting certain parts of it. Many anti-cancer antibiotic drugs target translation, so you could even have fun with it and do some research about a drug and see how this applies to your learning. A couple final thoughts in translation are polyribosomes and simultaneous transcription and translation. Polyribosomes just means that on a single molecule of RNA, we're having translation occurring at multiple ribosomes. This can occur in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells and is going to increase the rate of protein synthesis. Simultaneous transcription and translation can only happen in prokaryotic cells. That's because eukaryotic cells undergo transcription in their nucleus and they undergo translation in the cytosol. Because prokaryotic cells lack a nucleus, they have the ability to directly start translating the product of transcription while transcription is still happening. So this actually enables them to have a very high rate of gene expression. I hope you found this video really helpful. The concepts and information presented in these videos will be true no matter what genetics class you are taking. However, the concepts presented in this video are referencing material currently covered in Baylor University's coursework. Remember, if you are currently enrolled as a Baylor student, we offer free tutoring services. Our tutoring center is located on the first floor of the Sid Richardson Building. You will find all the details you need to know about these services on our website, www.baylor.edu. tutoring You may schedule a free 30-minute one-on-one tutoring session online through Navigate, or just drop in during our open business hours. For more information about our current services, please visit our website. Thank you.